You're listening to Inside Air, a behind the wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology, and operations. Hi, I'm Flight Lieutenant Chris Solly, and welcome to the latest RAF Inside Air podcast. In this episode, we'll catch up with the Warrant Officer of the Royal Air Force, Warrant Officer Subramaniam. We need to be a lot more disciplined than what we see in in civilian life, I guess, about what what we do, what what we're employed to do. You you try to boil the ocean because you think you need to do something for the first 100 100 days. I did the total opposite. I think the junior NCOs and NCOs should care for the people they are under their charge, and they should treat them in a way they would treat their own family. As usual, we'll also reheat a few stories which could have slipped under your radar, and we'll be finding out who's under the hat this week with AS1 Ben Russell. Best location you've served? To be honest, RAF Coningsby, because of the typhoons, but also the BBMF. I mean, who wouldn't like to be woken up from an afternoon nap on an afternoon summer's day in the garden by a Lancaster practising its low-level flying? Warrant Officer Subramaniam has been in post as the Warrant Officer of the Royal Air Force for the best part of a year now. But what does the role actually mean and what does he hope to achieve? His background, being born and growing up in Malaysia as the son of a royal engineer, a spell in the army himself, gaining a law degree and eventually joining the Royal Air Force as one of the oldest recruits in his flight, have given him a fresh perspective on all things military and working to get the best from the entire RAF team around him. Squadron leader Peter Lisney caught up with him for Inside Air. Warrant Officer of the Royal Air Force, WORAF, Warrant Officer Subramanian, or subby to your mates, welcome to Inside Air. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. It's re- really good. I mean, we've, we've, we've been looking forward to having you, inviting you onto Inside Air since you took the post of Warrant Officer Royal Air Force. Uh, and that was... Um, when did that happen? Uh, I keep saying a couple of months ago, but actually March last year. <laughs> March last year. So we're, we're almost... At, you know, we're coming up to first anniversary. And what I'd like to really know, first of all, you know, just to kick this off... What is the role of Warrant Officer Royal Air Force? Uh, it's an interesting question because, uh, to be honest, um, I've been trying to work it out myself to, to an extent because it's one of the things, right, when you look at the terms and references of a particular job, it kind of pretty much covers about five or six different things. But technically, I suppose, the role of the Royal Air Force is pretty much engaging with people, trying to find out all the good things, the bad things and all the challenges happening in the Royal Air Force and trying to push that back up to Air Executive Committee or Air Force Main Board so that these two particular organisations know exactly what the challenges are and what the Air Force um, day-to-day, what do you call that, um, or what day-to-day things are happening in the Royal Air Force. Yeah, yeah, it's almost a back-to-the-floor for the senior leadership team, so they've got eyes and ears on the ground, is that what it...? That's correct, so equally, this position also responsible for um, the JSB when it comes to things like uniform, okay. about deportment, um, about clothing and, um, and things like that. So I do get a lot of questions when it comes to things like, uh, can I have a top knot, which I had to Google it anyway, because I don't know what <laughs> that was. Uh, Interesting, because be- before I came here, I had a chat with the, the warrant officer on our squadron, and uh, he's a former station warrant officer. I said, have you got any questions for warrant officer Royal Air Force? And he said, ask him what he thinks about beards. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason why I don't have one, because it looks grey, very grey. <laughs> oh, right, OK. That's the reason why. Um, to, to be honest, I think um, this is Subby's view, right? We have evolved quite a lot, I suppose, since this is exactly when uh, the, the original, original life was back in 1918. Um, we have to evolve with, with, with how society is. And equally, if, if you go back, um, during the Victorian time, we still had the uh, Indian soldiers from India, the Sipais and the, um, the Sikhs, who actually had beard, and they thought that was acceptable purely because of race and religion, things like that kind of thing. So I don't think we're doing something new. No. It's just different way of looking at it. So as long as the swords, not me, so the swords think that it's it's tidy, it's clean, and, and it's within regulation, 
I, I don't think maybe, what, what's wrong with it. Maybe we're catching up with the Royal Navy. Oh, probably so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, uh, Royal Officer Subby, people love you. That's, that's, that's what I've found out when I've been talking to people. They really respect you and, and enjoy your company, love having you visit their units. Now, for people to say that about a warrant officer who's like a supercharged station warrant officer, that's pretty amazing, I thought. It's humbling. First and foremost, and um, I think the Air Force has changed now, has it? <laughs> I thought they're supposed to be scanner warrant officers. No, no. But, I know. Uh, honestly, I, I think it's very humbling. Um, one of the questions I asked during my interview is that, tell me about yourself. Uh, tell me five words that describes you um, before you just left the interview. And my answer was, I am a people person. Um, and I think... That's probably why, I suppose. I think I can't just get on with everyone and equally, right? And then people are already being kind um, by saying that um, <laughs> I'm approachable, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about your parents and your family and your upbringing and, and how you came to be in the Royal Air Force. Ah. Oh. <laughs> um, well, my dad, ex Royal Engineers, um, served um, quite a long time back in Malaysia. Um, I was born in Malaysia. Um, Background-wise, um, mum's from Vanuatu, um, Catholic, dad's a Hindu. So from, from the word go, uh, it's pretty much trying to work out exactly where, where you set kind of thing. Um, left Malaysia um, when I was about 19 years old, um, came across the UK because I did my A-levels and got my results and the results were pretty good. But the best thing they could offer me back in Malaysia was organic chemistry. Um, where I was back in the in UK, I probably would have walked into one of the best universities with doing medicine or law kind of thing. Um, so I had a massive disagreement with my dad and left. Um, came across. The only reason why I joined the army purely because I was I was broke. The money can only go that far. So being Commonwealth was easy, joining the army kind of thing. So I spent some, some time in the army, left um, Royal Engineers, went to university, um, did a law degree, and I had a place in Lincolnshire to be a barrister, but didn't have the money. And I thought, right, fair enough, I have to join the military again, I guess, because it kind of worked the first time around. So I thought, I'll try something different. So I went to the careers office in Sheffield to join the Royal Air Force. Uh, went for my commission, um, but didn't get through my commission. I was a bit impatient. Um, so I joined up as enlisted back in 1998. How old were you? Um, I was 30. I, I, I was 30 when I joined up. So I was the, I was the oldest recruit in my, in my flight um, because Holzmeyer um, the, the senior man, I think he was 19, 12 taken, and he was considered quite old compared to the rest of them. And you were the granddad. <clears throat> oh, oh, yes. The great granddad, probably. Yeah. Wow. OK. Is that because uh, today uh, we, we have a lot of late entrants into the Royal yes. Air Force, but 1998, there wasn't such a big thing then, was it? Oh, that's correct, because I think we recruit now up to age 48. Um, and obviously reserves um, is a different thing, but, but back then, being being 30, or I was nearly 31. The reason why I was nearly 31, because as ex-service, um, you were allowed to join up to 35. So here you are, you, you, you decide to be, be enlisted in the Royal Air Force. Which trade did you select, or were you told what to do? Oh, um, originally, um, the intention was, um, in analyst imagery or in analyst voice, but there was a year wait um, because I think the recruitment, so to speak, kind of thing, I think uh, they, they maximized the recruiting for the year. And um, being a Scopy or TG12 then, which is um, air and space operations, um, what was the only one which was open. So the t then the lady who was recruiting, the, the sergeant, was that particular trade. And she said, that's the best trade you can ever join in her. And I thought, yeah, well, why not? And that's what happened. And funny enough, I actually met her um, during my phase two training. And I was very happy to meet her, to say, thank you very much for what's going on. And say, oh, so what's your plan? And she said, oh, I tell you what, this trade is so bad, I'm actually leaving. Oh, she no. actually <laughs> <eats it. laughs> but, but to be honest, though, um, I, I've had a grand time. And I think I may, I'm very thankful to that lady because I think I made the right choice. And if it's not for this particular profession, I don't think I would have had all the, um, all the adventures and all the um, uh, things afforded to me. If there's anything that's been imprinted on your mind forever, what, what event or deployment has that been? 
posting wise, I think probably um, US. I, I've never been to Afghanistan. I've never been to Iraq. Um, volunteered enough times, but because I had a um, what do you call that a, a ticket um, to be a tactical radar operator, so I ended up going to Falklands. I've been to Falklands about five times, at least I'm sorry, six times. Um, some of it back to back kind of thing, purely because of that. So when it comes to one of the best postings I've ever had, it has to be the US, because the mission system was phenomenal. Um, the living in the US was, was amazing. And the good thing is it was good for family. So my daughter had an amazing time, my wife had an amazing time. So I think my highlight was um, going to do space, space and infrared system at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado. I know that family is really important to you. How do you manage or how have you managed to balance the, the needs of your family to the needs of the Royal Air Force during your career? To be honest, I think it, it wasn't that difficult. The reason why, because my wife was act service. She was post support before uh, we had Amelia and, and she left and she came back, I mean, she's back now as a civil servant. So she, she kind of understands exactly the challenges and the deployments and things like that kind of thing that comes with the job. So in that sense, um, it, you always started um, the relationship uh, on, a, on, on a good footing because you know exactly what it is kind of thing. So equally, applying for this job or applying for Space Command before that, I've got an accord with my wife for three years that this is what the challenges are, this is exactly what I need to do, I might not be home quite all the time. That's easy, but my daughter is slightly different. I'm trying to explain to a 16-year-old now why that, like today, for example, um, she was late for school because the bus was cancelled. I just didn't have the flexibility to take it to, to college, so my wife had to do that. And, and that is the subtlety that I had to deal with kind of thing. So, But it's like, it's like a family, right? It's a family unit. So you explain your challenges and you work it out together. OK. Who has been the most inspirational person for you in your career and why? Well, there's been... There's been a few. Um, I remember sending an email saying thank you to these three ladies who were my sergeants and flight sergeants when I first joined up kind of thing. Um, and they, they were, when I actually came into the trade, because being old, older, and um, struggled, I did struggle because English wasn't my first language. So it's like, there's a lot of things I didn't understand, I suppose. And this three of them pretty much took me in under their wing kind of thing and mentored and coached me all the way through. So I had to say thank you to these three wonderful ladies um, from RF Need to Say. And the one particular person that stands out to me among all is, is, is a chap called Warren Alexander um, Carter. AJ passed away a few years ago. He was the Warren officer that stopped me from eating, to be honest. Purely because we had a long chat who made me stay, and on top of that, I ended up working for him um, for, for a period of time. So you um, nearly left, you nearly left here. Force. Yes, I did. Yeah, because when you came back from the US, when I looked at um, the program I was in, I I thought that I wasn't empowered enough. I wasn't. Um, I, I think there was a lot of changes, right? From 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 working a mission system that you were in charge of sixty people to coming in, you're pretty much in charge of one, and trying to live a mission system which is slightly a lot different compared to what we were doing before and, and the pace of work was different too because the US was very busy supporting Afghanistan and Iraq from at, at a distance um, and I came in one Sunday um, evening and I thought oh, I'm, I'm going to eat tea AJ pretty much um, spoke to me and said right these are all the things that you can do in the Royal Air Force and these are all the things that he's going to end up doing because he was being he, he was appointed the branch of trade advisor and he said, if you fancy applying for the job, and if you're successful, come and work for me and see what we can do for the trade, how we can change the trade and make it better than the fact you're leaving because you think you're not delivering, the trade's not delivering what you expect the trade to deliver. And that's what happened. So I ended up working for him for nearly 18 months. And yeah, it has to be AJ. Okay. Now, I imagine you speak to a lot of aviators around the Air Force, and I guess you get to speak to people that are thinking of leaving and, and you know that's absolutely fine isn't it because people have multiple careers in their in their lives what, what are some of the things that you talk to people that are thinking about you know maybe I've I'm done it's time to move on I think the opportunities I think that's why I forgot what I wanted to 
ET, I think what I forgot is what the Air Force afforded me. I'm the walking example of someone who left Malaysia, came across and joined a service, um, the Royal Air Force, and the the opportunities and education and all the things that the Air Force offers you, I don't think people realise that because we don't sing or we don't shout enough about it. So when people are thinking about leaving and when I have the opportunity to speak to them, this is what pretty much the conversation is. Pretty much, I know it sounds bizarre, almost talking about myself, but using myself as an example of why someone should consider staying in the Air Force rather than someone leaving the Air Force. So following on from that then, for an aviator that joins this year, why should they set their sights on perhaps making this a lifetime career? I think the question is why not, right? Because um, I was very fortunate um, and humbled um, when the um, Sergeant Commander Shawbury, um, who grabbed Sandy Barron, asked if I would be the, the first reviewing officer as a warrant officer for the graduation of Air and Space Operations um, class last year. And during the speech, um, the, the reviewing officer speech kind of thing, the one thing I did say to all of them is that there's a lot of challenges in the Air Force. There are a lot of challenges, but the Air Force is also a place of opportunities. And they need to go and find that rather than just sit down and hoping for it to um, get come to you kind of thing. And, and, and my conversation with them is basically go and look for it because the thing is that people don't sing or shout about it. And I think the reason why someone should stay on the Air Force, uh, the Royal Air Force, is that if you join at the age of 16 or 16 and a half or 17, just after finishing your GCSEs, there is an opportunity for you to do A-levels in the Royal Air Force. There's an opportunity for you to go and do your bachelor's degree, your master's degree, and your PhD if you want to. And on top of that, there are skills and, um, that are afforded to you throughout your career that you can actually transfer across to civilian life if you wanted to kind of thing. And equally, though, is that people are different, right? People got different aspirations in life. Some people want to stay for six years and see what happens. But providing they leave the service after six years happy and knowing that they can come back because now you can join up at the age of 48. So if you leave, say, the age of 25 or 30 or whatever, happily, and you think, right, let's test the water and see, and see what happens, and decide to come back five years later, why not? Because I want people to leave happy and join back up um, because they know the Air Force is the right place for them to be when something changes in life, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, so what's, what's your secret to not being a grumpy old warrant officer? My wife's my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got much of a chance of being grumpy at home. I try to be, though. <laughs> so, so, so you bring your happiness to work? Yes. Now, your, your day job today, you, you work alongside the Chief of the Air Staff. Um, what's it like working with the boss? I like tin the boss. Um, Sir Rich is amazing. Um, I'm, I'm not saying it for sake of saying it. This is not a Christmas video. Um, <laughs> it's about empowerment piece. Now, I think um, I'm lucky enough. Um, we've got ASC, DCAS, and the boss. They all empower me. So um, the brief I had from, from, from CAS when I was appointed is that, or when I spoke to him, they said, what's my left of arc, right of arc, sir? Um, what's my brief? And he said, you haven't got one, Savvy. Um, what you've got is... Follow your gut. And I, I, I think the best statement ever. So working with Chief is amazing because one, that I get a chance to see a lot of things. I get a chance, I, I, I got exposed to a lot of different mission sets, um, people, um, about the challenges, about the success of the Royal Air Force, which historically, sir, I mean, I've always been an operator. so. I've not seen most of the things prior to this job. So every day, it's a school day. So you walk in through the door and think, wow. And, I, I know that. and to be honest, it, it might sound a bit, um, what do you call that, corny, I guess. I did thank the boss a couple of times. He said, but you stop saying thank you. Because if I've not got the job, I wouldn't have been exposed to any of those. So the, the answer to the question is, um, yeah, it's, it's a phenomenal boss to work for. And I'm having a grand time. Good. Uh, now, a lot of people talk about the first 100 days in post, and I guess that was a time for you to kind of get your ducks in a row and work things out. 
what what do you most want to achieve whilst you are Warrant Officer Royal Air Force? I'm glad you asked that question because I was a bit confused for the first 100 days. Um, the reason why, because you, you know when you look at the Air Force, and the Air Force wasn't, wasn't a good place and there was a lot of challenges, I suppose, when, uh, when Kaz and I um, um, were appointed. But you, you try to boil the ocean because you think you need to do something for the first 100 days. I did the total opposite. I pretty much looked at it in the first first uh, first month or so and thought, oh, I need to do so many different things. But then I didn't do anything. Um, the one conscious decision that I did make, though, for the first six months that I didn't travel overseas, it was internally focused rather than outward focus. So there's a lot of overseas visits that I cancelled or sent someone else because I think I needed to speak to people to find out exactly where I need to be after the 100 days. But one thing that I did find out during the 100 days is that I need to focus on empowerment. Um, because in order to try to deliver ACE... That's agile combat and employment. employment. We need the leaders to look slightly different. x engineers, we deliver, we've been delivering ACE for years, and Curtis LeMay was doing that in the Second World War. It's not something new, but I think that the, the way our mindset was was slightly different in order to deliver ACE. So we need to look at the empowerment piece and leadership piece at all levels, whether you are AS2, with the AS1 or a warrant officer or a wing commander group captain. So I went across to Tele Academy and spoke to Tele Academy to see exactly how we can actually get an education built in to deliver a leadership portion of it rather than just talking about leadership. Because when I looked at a lot of courses that have been delivered, it looked very much like a management courses rather than leadership courses. AMLC, IMLC, JMLC. So the first 100 days, one of the things we discussed about was the empowerment piece what attached to the empowerment piece was education. The second thing I realized that somebody asked me this question when I went to AMLC and JMLC, what is your priority? I said, I haven't got one because I don't know what it is. And post 100 days, I've decided that my priority is people. It might sound corny, but people are the most important thing because we, you can speak about infra, uh, but it boils down to people because you make infra better people. The people uh, live in, in the infra. In the infra. <laughs> we talk about mission sets. It's about people delivering the mission sets. So whatever you talk about, you can have the most expensive equipment in the world. It is all about people. So people is my focus. So the, to answer the question the first 100 days, that, that was a realisation period. Um, what does empowerment look like? I mean, can you put some um, meat on the bones on that? The empowerment... It, it, I mean, you can look at it objectively or subjectively, right? So if you look at it in Sabi's way of looking at empowerment, empowerment comes in two folds, I guess. One is pretty much how your your leadership empowers you to do things, giving you enough space and scope for you to achieve things what you want, want to achieve. And knowing that if you make a mistake, it's learning that takes place rather than uh, you made a mistake and you need to be punished for that. And empowerment's also about giving you the right tools for you to actually deliver in what you think is right. So, um, to, to speak an example, um, is, I'm, I'm the best example for it, I suppose, because when Cass said to me, follow your gut, I know for a fact that I, I can go out there and make a good judgment about what is right for the Air Force, what's right for me, and what's right for our people, because I know for a fact that I've got Kaz's back. And, and I think whilst we talk about it, I don't think everybody do it. The reason why, because people always worry that something, what happens if something goes wrong? As long as it's not danger to life. Are you perhaps suggesting allowing people to make mistakes? Allowing people to fail? Kind of. As, as long as it, it doesn't endanger life, it, it is not risk of life, it's not risk to operations, whatever kind of thing. I think we need to give them enough scope, I guess, to to, to have the error built into that so that people know that, um, one, they can go back and um, get the support they need if at all they think they're going to make a mistake. And secondly is that if they don't make a mistake, they know for a fact that they can go out there and speak the chain of command or the specialist and come back and go, right, 
And I understand the mistakes made, but guess what? Let's work together, see exactly how we can fix this so that this mistake doesn't happen again in the future. Mm -hmm. With this empowerment, have you seen any change? So we're coming up to a year in post. Have you seen any successes yet? It's slowly getting there, I, I think. Um, Kaz talks about it all the time, as, as, far, as far as station commanders are concerned. And I talk about it quite a lot in IMLC, JMLC, AMLC, HMLC. It's only getting there. But, but the thing about empowerment, it's a weird one, right? Because is it tangible? Which is bizarre, because it's exactly how people feel. I think that's why trying to measure this is going to be a bit of a difficult one. I think it's very, it can be very subjective. Um, I need to speak to a lot more people to find out exactly. Whilst I think it's getting better, but I need to speak to a lot more people to try and find out um, how well we're doing, if you know what I mean. In the year or so you've been around in this post, what has frustrated you the most? The rate of change. Not really change, the rate of trying to get, to achieve something. That I was quite naive when I, when I, when I got this position, I guess, because I thought, um, the typical example is someone say, for argument's sake, um, a new uniform, um, barrack shirts. I know a lot of people are going to get excited about this. Barrack shirts was was the best example I could give. And it, it's, a, it's a simple line. Um, it basically says, Royal Air Force, person not entitled to wear barrack shirts um, because we didn't pay into it. For those that don't understand, can you just give a... Right, to the, the PCS, the PCS uniform, what do you wear? The barrack shirts is what? That hasn't got the Velcro stuff, it's just got buttons and two pockets. Um, it so looks you combat, basically. That's right. So you look smart. And um, and a lot of people want to wear that, right? It, it, it's it's um, pretty much issued to the army because the army paid into the I, I, into the fund to 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 procure barrack shirts. The only group of people within the Royal Air Force is, is RF Regiment who actually paid into it. It was then barracks to be able to wear a shirt. So to me, there was a quick fix. But guess what? It's a lot of people have got them. I've got them because that was issued to me um, um, when, when I was in Falklands. Um, but obviously, GSB says you're not supposed to wear it. So I thought, oh, it's quick enough to fix it. Just remove that. Should be a problem, right? Because the AP is ours, so it's easy to fix. And until the um, Dress and Policy Steering Group explained, Subby, there's a lot more to this because there's payment um, attached to it, how much of an investment you can put in it. So removing it is a straightforward thing. But obviously, there's so many different things that we need to consider the second order, third order effect kind of thing. And I was naive because I thought well, it was a quick fix. So the thing that frustrates me most is that whilst we know how to fix it, we just don't have all the levers to get things done because it just takes time. But the thing is, I don't think enough people got strategic patience, I guess, is that the word for it? That people are not willing to wait to get things done. And up to this point in time, I've been quite lucky because people have uh, I've got some patience with me, but I think... Um, it probably runs out fairly, fairly swiftly, I guess, in the next six months or so. Now, leaders are responsible for standards and discipline, uh, right? You know, whether it's at command level, right down to in the T-bar. How should an RAF leader balance the need to maintain standards and discipline within the workplace versus their understanding of human nature and, and sometimes welfare needs? Standards prescribed, in a sense, we are a fighting force, um, we are professional arms, and there's a certain level of standards. And sometimes when you look at it, I think we need to be a lot more disciplined than what we see in, in, in civilian life, I guess, because about what, what we do, what, what we're employed to do. And I, I think leaders need to be very aware of individual circumstances, because whilst you deliver discipline, you deliver standards, and it should not be a blanket discipline or standard to everyone, because people need to look at individual circumstances. That's just why I think the Air Force is in a very good place now, or getting better at what it is, because you see SWORs, Station 1 officers especially, they're very much into the sphere of looking at individual things speaking to people and trying to work out exactly why people are behaving in a certain, certain manner. Uh, it's not that people are not disciplined, people are disciplined. But I think um, we as leadership, I think it's got a lot better now 
in, in trying to deliver the standards and the, and the discipline to, to people because we, we, we understand we're a lot more aware of the individual circumstances and individual challenges. I'm probably not answering the question. Well, I, well let, let, let me give you a slightly different question then. What, what advice would you give to our leaders, from junior leaders, junior NCOs uh, through to the, to the top, what advice would you give our leaders on how to maintain and sustain discipline and standards w w within their workplace when there's a lot of uh, social movement to perhaps relax some of those standards? All leaders, if you look at the Air Force and see the Air Force is a military organisation and the certain level of standards need to be upheld. I think they need to put that as a, as, as, as a test to say that this is exactly what the Air Force was to deliver. And equally, the way I deliver it is that I look back to my family, I guess. If I would discipline my child, Amelia, and I would probably do the exactly the same thing, um, to, to anyone who works with me because the, the, I care for my child and I think the junior NCOs and NCOs should care for the people they're under their charge and they should treat them in, in a way they would treat their own family and you know where the discipline is for the Royal Air Force is prescribed to say exactly what it is they should uphold the standards of what the Royal Air Force is supposed to be and then they should get people up to that standard and what happens in between trying to get the standard is, is where that um, the education, the training, and all the things that we I can deliver and we can deliver would help them to get there. On your travels around the Air Force, uh, you get asked a lot of questions from a lot of people. We would like to know, what are the top three questions that you were asked and how do you answer them? Infra has always been the top topic. Infrastructure. Right? Infrastructure. I mean, let's, let's boil that down. What do you mean? Um, the accommodation. See, see, that's the thing, because I always thought it was accommodation. But then I realised it's just not accommodation. It's also the technical accommodation about where they work. Um, so, yeah, infrastructure is always the topic of discussion, um, how to improve that. The thing is, th there is a plan for infrastructure, each station, uh, there's, there's funding allocated to exactly how to improve the, the, the infrastructure, either it's SLA, technical, or um, service families accommodation. But the thing is, it just is going to take time. Second one's food. Food has always been um, uh, uh, been a concern, especially with the contract, the, the, what we have kind of thing at the moment. I'm not talking about the quality of food is not good, but could you go to Lossy, for example, the quality of food is, is amazing. Some stations are slightly different compared to the others. Um, th there are things in play that uh, we're trying to improve food. Um, those who have not uh, read the Rafi report, uh, Hawthorne's Weights report, it, it's a really long name. I can't remember the, the, the full title of it. Um, the Rafi report. Rafi report looks into a lot of things, how to, how to improve our, um, our, our living standards, uh, about work, about um, about the career paths, and some of it's about infrastructure and it's about people. Um, so th there are plans ahead now to improve it kind of thing. The final one's pay. Um, pay has always been the question, but the thing is, this is what according to Sabi, whether right or wrong, our shareholders are taxpayers, and taxpayers got a lot to say exactly how much we earn, not how much we earn. I can't just turn around and say to someone, Fair enough. Um, why are you leaving the service? Oh, because I don't get paid as much as what um, I would have got paid if I were working for a contractor out there. It's fine, but the thing is, like, the Air Force just don't have the levers to give you an extra 70 grand a year. As long as I'm honest with people and tell people exactly what it is and the expectation manage people, these are all the three major questions that comes up. And there are a lot, a lot, a lot of them more, so other questions. Mm. Okay, yeah, where they live, what they eat, yes. and how much they're paid. they're paid. Yep. Uh, how do you get on with the station warrant officers? Because personally, you haven't been a station warrant officer, have you? No, I haven't, no. So, uh, so if your colleagues, how did they feel about you getting the big job if you haven't been a SWO? Well, hopefully they they like me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, funny you should say that, though, because uh, the first station I visited was Bry's, and that was a week after I was appointed. The reason for visiting Bryce 
not to see price, but to understand what this war did. Um, because, uh, to be honest, it's been a very, very steep learning curve when it comes to things like um, about, about uniform, about discipline, about service, um, about, about stations, um, things, what the uh, wars do kind of thing. So I, I've got a massive delta when it, when it, when it comes to, uh, well, swing, if that's the right word to use. Um, but the good thing is, they've been very kind to me. They have been filling the gaps I don't have kind of thing. The swores have been phenomenal. I'm not saying for sake of saying it, because we do have a catch up. And they pretty much tell me exactly all the issues and challenges, what, what's that kind of thing. But the one thing I've not I've done, though, is that I haven't got a long screwdriver, sir. Okay. To be honest, I think talking about empowerment thing, and that's the reason why I don't carry um, a stick or an SD hat. The reason why I don't carry one of those because I wear a barrier is purely because I don't need to go to the station trying to be the person who's in charge because I'm a visitor to the station. So the person who's in charge of the station is the station commander and the SWO. So I visit the station. So to me, I think that kind of worked really well because it's more of a working relationship and a friendship rather than just saying, oh, I'm the super SWO being, um, being war off or whatever kind of thing, which I'm not. Because at the end of the day, there's just a gig and when this thing comes off, I'm war officer like everybody else. So what message do you have today for your warrant officer colleagues across the Royal Air Force? We've been around for 105 years for a very good reason. The reason why I've been around, because we have had amazing people and we have got amazing people. The message I've got to all the warrant officers, which spoke about it during CASA's conference, is that families allow their children to join our service, join our family, which is Royal Air Force family, look after them. Look after them, empower them, treat them like how you treat your own family, because they are our family whilst you're in service kind of thing. And I think the Warren Officer cohort could do a lot more in trying to instill um, the the sense of belonging for all these individuals to join, join, join our thing, and equally lead lead and also mentor and counsel junior officers because by panic 27 that's what we're supposed to do and i don't think we do enough of that we're quick enough to complain saying the junior officer is not doing what they're supposed to be doing but it's an inherent in us for us to actually mentor them well for us to actually guide them through the thing and it works all the way down to as2 and all the way up to a flight of tenant and of 3 so i think my plea to the one officer is let's lead help me because there's a one-man gig, and I don't think I can do this by well myself if I, if I don't get you all to help me. So, um, yeah, th that's my message. Warrant Officer Supermanian Subby, it's been great to have you on Inside Air. Thank you for sharing your story, and uh, we, we look forward to seeing all the great things that you, you hope to um, do for the Royal Air Force. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate this. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm AS1 Victoria Andrews and with a look back at some recent news stories for the RAF, this is Reheat for Inside Air. The RAF is taking part in Exercise Red Flag alongside the United States Air Force and the Royal Australian Air Force out of Nellis Air Base in Nevada. Described as the world's most advanced air combat training exercise, the RAF's presence includes eight typhoons, a Voyager, rivet joint aircrew, and air operations controllers from 19 and 20 Squadron. Working with international partners strengthens the RAF's ability to deliver global security, protecting UK nationals both at home and abroad. A Typhoon fighter jet has been fitted with one of the world's most advanced radars ahead of initial flight trials. The European Common Radar System Mark II radar features a unique multifunctional array which will allow Typhoon to simultaneously detect, identify and track multiple targets in the air and on the ground while also performing electronic warfare tasks. The prototype radar will now undergo further testing and ground runs ahead of its first flight trials later this year. 
and the promotion training undertaken by officers has been refreshed and condensed. The Intermediate Officer Development Programme saw flight lieutenants previously undertake a three-stage programme known as IODs 1 to 3, but now will only do IOD A, a one-hit, three-week course that must be done before substantive promotion to squadron leader. The IOD 4 and 5 courses for squadron leaders before further promotion have stayed the same, but have been renamed to IOD B and C. That's Reheat on Inside Air. Thanks Vic. And now it's time to find out who's under the hat with Ben. I'm AS1 Ben Russell and this is Under the Hat, where we get to know an aviator in less than a minute. Name you're known by. Reverend Squadron Leader Lacey, Padre Chrissy. What's your profession? I'm station chaplain at RAF Coningsby and also on the recruitment team for chaplains. What's the best thing about your job? I love getting to meet so many different people across the whole of the RAF station and I enjoy this because I'm passionate about people reaching their full potential so seeing people enjoying sharing what they do makes my heart smile. Hardest part of your job? I have to do spreadsheets in my recruitment role this is definitely not a strong point that i hold it's not a gift of mine to use excel but i am getting there best location you've served to be honest RAF coningsby because of the typhoons but also the bbmf i mean who wouldn't like to be woken up from an afternoon nap on an afternoon summer's day in the garden by a lancaster practicing its low level flying what bit of luxury kit do you never deploy without To be honest, RAF Coningsby because of the typhoons, but also the BBMF. I mean, who wouldn't like to be woken up from an afternoon nap on an afternoon summer's day in the garden by a Lancaster practicing its low level flying. And what's your proudest moment in the RAF? The silence being bang on 11 o'clock at a remembrance service that I was running and the fly past happened exactly as the last note of the Ravelli rang out. For me, I was like, yes, nailed it. Thank you, Padre Chrissy, for helping us nail this episode of Under the Hat. And that's it for another episode of Inside Air. A reminder, please give us a review and subscribe on your favourite podcast app. It really does help with the numbers. And then join us again soon. You've been listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. If you're serving in the RAF and have a story for us, please speak to your unit media and communications officer. Inside Air is written and produced for the Royal Air Force by RAF Media Reserves.